Oh, and then you didn't unmute there. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to Talk of Thames Mead Online. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so just before we start, I just want to run through a little bit of kind of how um, this format works. So um, rather than it being a meeting, this is a web in kind of a webinar format. What that means is that um, we can't see or hear you. You should hopefully be able to hear, see and hear and hear us um, but we can't see you um, however at the bottom of the screen um, you should see a Q&A box um, some of you have found it already so brilliant thank you very much um, if you have so what we're going to do is we're going to go through, through some presentations and just talk a little bit about some stuff and then if you have any questions then please put them in the Q&A box and we will pick them up towards the end which I hope is all right with you um, so this month's theme is in your neighborhood so we've tried so we're trying these monthly and this month it's in your neighborhood um, and we have colleagues from across um, Thames Mead so we have um, colleagues from our Thames Mead team, neighborhoods, environmental services and our communities team and they're all going to tell us a little bit more about um, Thames Mead and their work in Thames Mead. Um, so guys, um, and one by one if you'd like to introduce yourself. So Ellen, would you like to introduce yourself please? Hi, hi, uh, my name's Ellen. I'm a director of strategy and programme for Thamesmead, so I work in the Thamesmead regeneration team, uh, looking at all the various plans and uh, programmes that are happening in the area. And you'll see me testing my video button as I popped up a minute ago. So. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Um, and Fiona? Hi, everyone. I'm Fiona. I'm the community properties manager for Peabody. Um, so I oversee and manage all of our community spaces uh, across the portfolio and in particular in Thamesmead. Thanks, Fiona and Jackie. Hi. Oh, funny voice. Right. Hi, I'm Jackie Chazelle. I'm a neighbourhood manager in Thamesmead and my area is south now. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Pablo? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pablo. I'm the head of neighbourhoods for the south region. Uh, so I cover, so my team cover, um, uh, Southwark, Lewisham, Bromley, Sutton, as well as Thamesby. And uh, you'll be hearing a lot more from me tonight. Thanks, Pablo. And Craig? Hello, my name is Craig Kilpools, and I am the water supervisor for Thamesby. Thanks, um, Craig. Um, you said water supervisor, didn't you? You broke off there for a second. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and oh, there's so many of us I'm trying to remember. So, um, and Tom, Tom, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm, I'm Tom. I'm head of environmental services at Thames Mead. So I'll be talking to you about the team and what we do a bit later. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And last but not least, John. No, John, are we having technical difficulties? Um, well, I'll just, I'll introduce you for you. Um, so we've got John Wilson, who is the Traveller and Equine Liaison Officer, and he will be hopefully giving you, oh, he's going to pop up, I don't know. He's going to be giving you some information um, about um, tra the Traveller community. Is that right, John? Yes, I think it is. Okay, all right. Um, thanks very much. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to just share my screen um, and then as I said we'll, we're going to have um, some presentations just to share a little bit of information. Um, so first up, oh, if I can switch my slides, there we go, first up is Ellen. So Ellen would you like to start please? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So I'm just going to do a really short introduction. We thought it's a really nice time to just explain a little bit about who Peabody is and uh, what we're doing in Thamesme. Then I'll hand over to the team to talk about in more detail on various bits of those. But um, I mean, as a starter, just to say Peabody is one of London's oldest housing associations, one of the first. So we were set up by a founder, George Peabody, in 1864. Um, today, the Peabody Group is responsible for more than 67,000 homes. Um, across London and the South East, so about 155,000 residents. Um, and as hopefully you've obviously seen, we have plans to join together with Catalyst as well, which will mean we're an even sort of larger organisation. But one of the really, I think, strongest parts of Peabody is our commitment to local neighbourhoods. And the work we do in Thames Media is a good example of that. Um, so first slide, 
Sarah Jane is. Um, so Thamesmead, as you all know, because you live there, is a pretty remarkable place. I think one of the things that we always notice is just how much larger it is than people sometimes realise. So around, you know, 46,000 people live in an area called Thamesmead. Um, it's about 16,000 homes. And of those, Peabody is responsible for um, looking after and managing around 5,200 homes. And beyond that, we also have a lot of responsibilities in the town, which are quite unusual for a housing association um, and come from the fact that Galleons Housing Association and Tilton Land, um, which was a, a development company, and Trust Thamesme joined the Peabody Group in 2014, which was when we first became involved in the area. So that means that a lot of the town's housing and community activities and um, public spaces have become part of the, uh, part of the group. Um, so we look after various bits around the town, some quite unusual stuff. Um, so the town centre, you can see the picture of next there and some of the commercial and the retail spaces, we look after those. We also look after the community spaces, which Fiona will talk to you a little bit more about, um, the new and the existing ones. And we look after the parks and waterways. There are over 50,000 trees in Thamesmead and the five lakes and canals, and we look after all of those as well. As I say, we'll talk to you a little bit more about how we do that in general. So, I mean, there's lots in the area that we're not responsible for. Um, so, you know, we don't empty your bins every week, for example, that comes under Bexley or Greenwich Council, depending on where you live. Um, but we also do pick up um, lots of rubbish on our land and we do things like fly tipping, which uh, Tom and the teams will talk to you a bit more. So we, we do a lot around the town um, and we're investing a lot, as you will hopefully have seen. And that includes in all the areas that we're responsible for in the existing areas, as well as the new as well. So that's me done, I think, as an introduction. Um, I will we'll segue into Pablo, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about the neighbourhoods teams. Um, thank you very much, Ellen. And just to remind people, if you do have any questions as the presentations are going on, please do put them in the Q&A box. So Pablo, please. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Sarah and Ellen. So uh, um, as I mentioned before, I'm Pablo. I'm the head of neighbourhoods for the South region. So today I'm just going to speak to you, um, whoever's around, I can't tell who's around. <laughs> it's a very surreal experience here. But I'm just going to sp uh, speak to you about uh, the team um, some of the activities that we carry out and as well as our plans for the future, especially now that we're in the, in the midst of a merger. So Sarah, we can go over to the first slide. Thank you very much. So just to give you an idea as to uh, what the South region looks like, um, it's composed of uh, a lot of different mini teams within our, within our region and that includes neighbourhoods. So uh, Jackie was one of our neighbourhood managers. She is one of eight in, this, in the Tesmi team. Um, and they, that is managed by an area manager. But equally, we, because we look after other areas, we also have an additional eight different neighborhood managers that cover the rest of it. So if you just have a quick uh, look at that map, you will be able to see that just roughly how big the South region is within Peabody with uh, just over um, 18,000 properties that we, that we actually manage. Um, we, uh, amongst those, uh, those responsibilities is tenancy fraud. So uh, as much as we, we want to think that a lot of our residents are maintaining the property in a, in, a, in a good condition and everything is going there uh, as, as we hope it's going, we do have a few residents who have actually misused their properties and that's where our tenancy fraud team come into it. And they, they're also supported by the wardens who, again, we've met Craig, who's, uh, who's going to be able to answer any questions that you might have in relation to the warden team. But they, they provide some, uh, some local support, some local, um, and they also manage some local initiatives, working closely with the police. And uh, it's, it's just to allow us to, to provide that extra level of security that isn't available across all of Peabody. The warden team is quite unique to terms me, and uh, I will say that they're, they're, a, they're an invaluable asset to, to, what we, to the service that we provide. Um, we also have our local hub, which is in Joy's Dawson Way. I'm sure many of you will probably already know it. And it's, again, it's another team that we, we also look after. And it's uh, it, because it comes from the legacy galleons, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff are very familiar. We've got quite a large history and uh, com uh, probably multiple years of experience with, um, of, of people that have known and even live in Thamesmead. And a new addition to our little Thamesmead family neighborhood is going to be our South Mere Concierge team who are going to be joining us by the end of the year. Now, don't worry, so we're okay to move on to the next one. <laughs> 
Fantastic. So uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, the neighborhood manager, they, they wear a lot of different hats and uh, it can be a little bit difficult to just uh, take one on and put the other one off. But I just wanted to list a few of the activities that they're involved in and some of the some of the ways that you may have come across them. So um, the way that we call it is our bread and butter is to support a residence and uh, that can come in uh, in a variety of different ways. And uh, unfortunately, one of the main activities that takes a lot of time is community safety. So that's antisocial behavior. Those it's, a, it's again, it's just uh, referring back to that point of actually addressing some of those concerns that might be affecting the community. So in, in the first instance, we always try and support residents wherever we can, but we do appreciate that if there are repeated or ongoing issues, we'll have to take more of an enforcement action. And uh, I'm sure Jackie can actually give us a bit more examples as to how, how easy or challenging that can be, but it is one of those things that um, we, we don't take any pleasure of it, but it is always satisfying whenever we get um, lasting resolutions. Um, we also have a, a general support, so uh, because we know that there's a, there's a, a wide diversity of our residents, um, not everyone has the same level of support and th those needs will also need uh, uh, tailorized approaches. So our neighborhood managers, they, because they are front facing and they uh, come across a lot of different residents, they generally tend to work with them on a, on a temporary basis just to make sure that we can actually get our residents the support they need, if that means signposting them to local agencies or connecting them to, to services, uh, that is one of the roles that the neighborhood man uh, managers actually play. Um, uh, along with the less interesting sort of uh, tasks like compliance checks. So um, going out there to do, uh, to, do to support with uh, gas safety checks or uh, um, carrying out uh, inspections. Uh, in all honesty, a lot of these things we much rather deal with uh, with residents. It's a lot more interesting. <laughs> but when it comes down to um, to keeping people safe, that's where our neighborhood managers also uh, shine, and they get a chance to actually make sure that they're they're they're, they're keeping everyone, everyone in every uh, area that we manage at the very least uh, monitored and 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 in line with what we're trying to achieve. So if we jump over to the next slide. And again, this is uh, just a, this was just to give you a visual of what it looks like within Peabody. So a lot of these things, they are different processes that uh, our neighborhood team would be involved in. And one of the things that we, we which, what I just wanted to portray here is that um, the way that I normally describe it to residents whenever they ask me what does the neighborhood manager do is uh, if you refer back to your tenancy agreement, you'll probably see that there's maybe 20, 30 different clauses. Uh, rent is one of them and uh, transfers is the other one. And those are the two things that the neighborhood managers will deal with. Everything else they'll have some sort of involvement in. So let's jump over to the next slide. And uh, as I mentioned earlier on, um, now that we're merging with, uh, with Catalyst, uh, I just wanted to give you a bit more of a, an insight because this is some of the feedback that has come back from residents. I'm not sure how many of you engage with it, but so far we've, uh, we've had 1,069 responses to the consultation that we've done. And one of the prevailing sort of commentary that we've had is uh, just a general concern about the neighborhood manager and losing that sort of uh, interaction that you might have with uh, with people that you know. So at this point in time, even though we can't we can't provide anything more solid, what we'll say is that um, the neighborhood manager and the warden team, the, the testing reception team, they they all provide a service that that can be replaced. So from that perspective, there's no plans, there's no strategy to try and remove those resources or try and actually decrease the level of interaction that we have with residents. In fact, we, we actually want to create a, a more localized approach. So a local offer that actually works with residents and works with local communities to make sure that we can actually deliver on um, on any any sort of issues and solutions that, that, that might be affecting the community. So if it, if it is something that's particularly of interest and, uh, and something that you, um, you want to raise any questions about, then feel free to ask us a and like I said, I mean, at this point in time, it is very early stages into the merger. So it's not something that we'll be able to provide any solid sort of commentary on. But with uh, 37,000 new homes that will be taken over, um, over in the next uh, financial year, it does mean that we are going to have to um, revise our approach and make sure that we are working efficiently. We don't lose that, that knowledge that we've already worked over so many years to build. And essentially, we, we still want to hear from residents. We want to make sure that you, that you can actually don't have any obstacles when it comes down to speaking to us, raising your concerns and uh, just communicating with Peabody in general. So this is a, a really quick overview of what the team does, what the, who the team, uh, who, what the team consists of. 
But um, if there's any questions, if there's any anything that you want to ask us later on, uh, myself, Craig, and Jackie will be here to answer any questions on that. Line. But thank you very much for your time. Lovely. Thank you very much, Pablo. Um, so next we have Tom. Oh, look, you've got a fancy graphic, Tom. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> um, so, Tom, you're up next. Yes, it worked. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Brown. I'm Head of Environmental Services at Thames I uh, look after all of our colleagues in the Environmental Services team. Let's try, please. Let's host this for the most. This. Um, yeah, so this is, this is a brief picture of our um, of some of our team and the guy in the front is John Fryer. John's one of our service managers. Um, and I won't tell you why I was dressed like that day, but he was waiting to be dunked into a cold water tank um, at the pleasure of the of the of the wider team. So yeah, we, we, we sort of once a year we take part in that. We haven't for the last couple of years, but clearly because of COVID, etc. The team's really important to us. Um, we've got around 145 staff. Uh, we run services like Caretaker Plus, Grounds, uh, Street Cleans in. We've got GOS specialists. We look after minor civils, uh, tree services team, canals, traveller liaison. John uh, Wilson, who's our traveller liaison officer, will be talking to you a bit later. And we operate 365 days a year. So you'll see the guys and girls at Christmas Day, Boxing Day, um, doing the work in the blocks and bolt refuse. But I'm going to go through some of the services later and uh, you're happy to take questions at the end. SJ, please. Thank you. Yeah, so this is this is just a little a brief overview of our multi-trade team. So I've got to remember this one. So we've got four internal multi-trades that carry out works inside the blocks. So they do stuff like glazing, um, door repairs, they'll do flooring repairs, painting, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We've got two external multi-trades that do all of our um, repairs in our public mounds. So a lot of you may be, have been have seen the new bins going in. So that's our two multi-trades, Dean and Simon doing that. And they'll repair play equipment and fencing and uh, they'll do graffiti, really anything that needs doing that in the public realm. We've got two drainage guys, so that's Martin um, and um, Tony. So they, they do the um, our drainage operations. And then we've got four planned, two planned multi-trades, sorry. They do, um, they'll do plan painting programs. So and if we get any blocks that um, that are not up for painting or, or, not, or, or waiting for a few years for the painting programs to come through, we'll get those guys in to do that work. So yeah, it's, um, it's a really good service. We do around 4,700 jobs a year. This is last year's data. And we've got an average job cost of 92 pounds a job. Generally it's 100% on target because we operate fine and fit. We're not tied up with all the contractual obligations. And we've got a works value of about 370,000 pounds. Our target's about 350. So yeah, it's it's all good. Let's try. So this is our tree services team. So we've got five people in the tree in the team, including the um, Rebecca, who looks also the same. She's a tree services officer. We've just got out, you may have seen the job adverts, we've just got out to recruit a, um, a trainee arborist. So we're going to take someone for a two or three year program and send them off to college and get them get them fully qualified. So earlier, um, Helen Ellen mentioned that we have around 55,000 trees as, as, our, as our core tree stock. And that team manages all of those works. And what you're looking at there is a road closure when we were doing works down a crossways road and the, the, just to give you an idea of the risk involved so that guy you can see climbing he's taking down a faulty tree down at Broadwaters and if you you know the blocks of Broadwaters they're three stories high so you can see from that angle he's significantly higher than those three stories so yeah he was taking that down with a, with a, a technique called rigging um, not a job for me but it just gives you an idea of some of the risks that the, the guys for, you know, take on as a day-to-day -day work. Thanks that's true. Yeah, so this is our Caretaker Plus team. So we've got around 45, 50 caretakers across the whole estate. So they look after all of the tower blocks. We've got mobile teams doing mini blocks, we've got static caretakers doing the uh, linear blocks. So those, those teams have had quite a lot of investment over the last few years when we joined Peabody. So we increased the number of team, the number in the team to increase the standards. And um, it's had, had quite an impact on the blocks. We're not perfect by any way, shape or form. But um, you can see some nice examples of the innovation of the kit that we're introducing into that team 
to increase the standards. Yeah, it's um, yeah, really proud of what they've done. And uh, yeah, it's all been made possible by the investment from Peabody. Thanks, Mr. Yeah, so this is, sorry about this photo. This is a Canals team. So um, you can see the two Chris's there. And we've got a third member of the team as well. Um, so three guys look after um, seven kilometres of canals within Thames Bay, three major lakes, and do various other works around, um, you know, the work with Thames 21 and third party partners. And what you can see, the, the two guys in the yellow suits that look like Teletubbies, but they're flotation suits. So where they get an awkward piece of canal that they can't access by boat and they need to go into the water, they can get into the water with those suits and basically they float around and bob around on their space. So yeah, it's um yeah, there's lots of really nice technology we're introducing into that. And some of you may we haven't got any today, but some of you may have seen Chris's, I call it Chris's, Chris's big blue boat called SpongeBob. Um that was an investment um again by the uh, organization sort of two years ago. We got that sixty odd thousand pounds and it's made an enormous difference to the way we manage the weed and litter on the canal system. Thanks, Esther. So our grounds team. So there's some nice, nice images here. So again, um, two years ago, we had some further investment in our grounds maintenance team to again, to improve the standards across the whole state, uh, both on our public open spaces and housing areas. These are some nice examples of innovation that they've been doing over the last few years. Um, so I think we, this is the second year we've done the Sunflower Field in Crossways Park and we've introduced more, more wild flora I think the third image is again is, is Crossways Park with some of the perimeter plants that we've done. And the, the bench seats there are, um, uh, yeah, some of the guys but have been doing some training. So they were introducing picnic areas in the park, etc. So we're continuing with that theme. Um, those guys look after. Um, so just to give you an idea, scale, they cut every time they cut the grass, they're cutting 700,000 square metres of grass. Every time we cut the grass, we've got an excess of 100,000 square metres of shrubberies. So in kilometres of canals, um, quarter million square metres of paving. I won't keep writing numbers off, but it just gives you an idea of the scale that of the scale that we look after. It's absolutely enormous. And I haven't got a clue why I put a picture of what's in there, but it looks great. So yeah. Thanks, that's Jack. Cheers. Yeah, so again, just give you an idea of some of the additional services we do. So during the winter months, where this was the last this winter just gone. So we had when we had the snowfall for a few days, I think about a week or so. So we carry 20 tonnes of salt stock at uh, Hay Road Base, and uh, you can see our salt techs out there carrying out salting activities. And we, we start those activities five o'clock in the morning, so we get guys going out, doing all like shopping centres, and then they go onto the roads, and then the teams are going to program to, to do high priority football areas. We don't park some probably open spaces. And the other picture is a picture of one of our um, sweepers at Paul driving that, um, that's our scarab sweeper. Um, that's the second or third one we've had in the last 15 years. We change them every five years. And we've got an additional two small additional two smaller sweepers that look after our housing areas as well. Just done. Rubbish. Wow. Um, yeah. So this is a big one for us. Um, this is an image from Christmas Day. This was about 10 o'clock. So, so this was the first. So Christmas Day, we normally have uh, four vans out, Boxing Day we have six vans out um, and they'll they'll work for six hours um, pulling rubbish off the estate. So just to give you some idea of scope, we clear about 1,500 tonnes of rubbish a year and that's incorrectly placed out rubbish that's fly tipping, that's rubbish from the bases of the blocks um, and that operation goes on 365 days a year. Um, it's a big distraction for us because clearly when we you know, like our parks mobile teams when they go through the parks clearing bins, they get held up, which has a knock-on effect on the sites if there's lots of fly tipping or rubbish. And this is exactly the same for our caretaking the streets teams. If they're detracting from doing what they should be doing, i.e. cleaning the blocks or polishing floors or adding value to what they do because they're picking up fly tipping. We work very closely with our warden service. So that's Craig here today and the team. Um, the Warden Services have got the enforce, have got enforcement powers via the Royal Borough of Greenwich, so they can issue enforcement notices um, to offenders. And we're working really closely with the London Borough of Bexley, although we've had quite a few challenges trying to get that in place. We keep chipping away at that as, as time goes on. So we've got really close partnerships with both local authorities. Um, 
really great with the Royal Borough of Greenwich and um, I'm really pleased that Bexley have just started a new contract with Countrywide Recycling and we're just about to set up uh, more, more close ties with their contractor to provide a more efficient service with Bexley. Of course, this is a couple of screenshots. So the first one you can see where you can see the word South, uh, sort of a Lewisham accent South. Um, <laughs> that, that is a picture of our GIS. So we've got um, Nathan. Nathan Carr is our, um, I think it's titled Spatial Data Specialist. Um, so he's a, he's a GIS mapping person. So quite often I'm challenged and people say we don't know what we own. Quite the contrary to that. So we've got a really detailed GIS system. So we've got both local authority um, adopted public highway layers on there. So that's the pink you can see there. Um, so we know exactly what the local authorities are responsible for. We've been working closely with the local, local authorities, getting them to update their public highway layer as well in the last six months or so, because there's certain areas of, that they have adopted and we've got adoption certificates for and they haven't got it on their record. So we've been work, working really closely with them. And we have um, detailed ownership data again on the GIS for all of our ownership. So we definitely know what we own. And you can see the numbers you can see on the um, on the box there are title numbers. So we can even drill down to HM Lead with HM Lead Shriek title numbers. We do a lot more with GIS. I'm not gonna um, sort of go into every facet of it today, but um, yeah, it provides a, a whole host of information across, across the organization. And the second one is a screenshot from our confirmed software and that is a job status screenshot within the software telling us how many jobs are outstanding uh, across the town for tree services. So we've got a piece of software confirming manages all our work. We've got guys out with mobile devices, um, booking jobs, collecting data, carrying out inspections. So we do a whole wealth of stuff with our confirmed software. Thanks. So um, pandemic. Uh, I guess you may guess that this is what this one is for. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, clearly it was a big issue for us. Um, you know, like me, like everybody, you just we, we didn't know what was happening as far as, you know, um, CV19, COVID was concerned and infection, et cetera, et cetera. So we had some really quite difficult conversations because we're a frontline service. We were expecting all of our teams to come to work and carry on really as normal as we could. We did lots of risk assessments. We made adjustments to our hours um, to keep people safe. But the whole team worked all the way through the pandemic. We had colleagues that were shielding as per government guidance, but everybody, absolutely everybody worked through. And that was caretakers, grounds maintenance people, street scene people, et cetera, et cetera. And that includes me and all the, and, and the office team as well. You know, if it was good enough for them, it was good enough for me. So the two images you can see there, one is Larry's, one of our trades. Um, so during the pandemic, we were delivering food parcels out to local Thamesmead people, and we were assisting other parts of the business. So we were going out to Charlton and Footscray and all over the place delivering food parcels for vulnerable people. And it was a bit, it was a bit strange because we used to have to drop, or we, I said the wrong way, we used to have to drop a food parcel on the floor by the doorstep, knock on the door, and then you know do the step back thing like you used to get your parcel. So, and the second image is um, Debbie, my wife, and friend, um, filling up sanitizer bottles. And we were just desperate at the time. Um, you know, we couldn't get all the sanitizer, um, you know, from any commercial area. So we were paying through the most for the big containers and then decanting into small bottles for the team. So, but yeah, um, once again, really, really proud of what the guys and girls have done. And um, yeah, nothing, nothing to say. Thanks, SJ. Next one. Yeah, so our electric fleet, um, I thought I'd give you a bit of an overview. Um, you probably see our vehicles going around the town. So we've made a start. It's, it's, it's quite a small start. Um, so we've got five electric vehicles now. Uh, we've just bought another three on board. That's the three you can see there. Um, so it's, it's, it's part of us. It's part of our um, objective to move to more, to more greener um, way of working. Um, it's quite a struggle for us, although we've got charging facilities at Haley Road. I mean, generally, as you're probably aware, there is quite a lack of infrastructure in terms of charging vehicles. So that's the thing that's holding us back at the moment. So but we're working on that with the um, with one of the central teams that are, are specifically looking at these projects. But yeah, it's a, it's a start and quite exciting. I don't know if you've ever driven one, but if you haven't, uh, try to get into an electric van because they're fantastic. They're just like driving a go-kart, just stamp your foot and it goes, you know, so. 
Thanks, yes, John. So, yeah, um, last bit. Um, that's John Wilson. I'm going to hand you over to John, and he's going to talk to you about Trevor and Equine. And, um, yeah, horses and general. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks so much, Tom. That was really interesting. Um, so I hope John's going to join us. I think he was having I'm a... Here. Hey, there he is. Can you me? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Hi there, I don't know if you can see me, but my name, I'm, I'm John Wilson. Um, I have a, a grand uh, job title called Traveller Liaison and Equine Officer. Um, equines, according to the, the law, also covers mules, donkeys, horses and zebras. So we're not yet having a, a herd of zebras streaming across South Mere Park at the moment, I hope. But um, I, I, part of my role is to... Uh, deal with grazing licenses. We have four paddocks in Southmere Park, which we rent out, um, but also deal with fly grazing and other issues, not just across Thamesmead. I get phone calls from local councils and all sorts of landowners about um, issues with horses. So let's have a look at the next one, please. Here are some issues. Obviously, one of the biggest issues um, that uh, as, as Thamesmead is developed for housing and commercial use, land available for grazing um, properly has been reduced. But there's been a long history of fly grazing, probably over a hundred years horses have been grazing along um, the Thames estuary from Gravesend through to Greenwich. Um, and this is where owners intentionally or negligently permit their horses to graze on land which they don't have consent from the owner to do. Now we have a lot of issues with, or we've had a lot of issues with fly grazing. And just, I thought I'd stick these pictures here to show you some of the issues. Some of the main issues with fly grazing is, for a start, they're a nuisance to public, uh, to the communities uh, in, the, in our parks and bits and pieces like that. Um, we've got a duty to care uh, to ensure that impacts upon our landscape don't impact the people who actually live there. And you can see from those top two pictures that when people fly graze horses, the ground underneath gets totally demolished. Your average horse produces 45 pounds of manure every day, which equates to seven and a half tons. Now, horse manure might be very nice for your rose beds, but it's absolutely rubbish for grass growing and things like that. So we've been trying to minimize that as much as possible. Tethering horses is actually quite not a nice idea. Horses are herd animals and they like to, to be with other horses. So when horses are tethered by themselves, for start they can wrap the chain around trees and, and the stump that they're, they're attached to. Um, so we try and, and, and clamp down on that quite hard if we can. And I think over the last few years, we've managed to reduce the amount of fly grazing we've had to, for, for quite, an, uh, quite an amount. There are two ways to deal with fly grazing. One is to work with the owner of the horse and persuade them to move it. The second is for us to actually seize the horse um, and take it away. One of the problems we have with seizing the horse is the moment we seize it, we own it. And so Peabody could end up with a whole herd of, of, of animals. And once we own it, it's our responsibility to get it fly, um, microchipped and passported and all sorts of bits and pieces like that. So we try not to take those actions of, um, of, of taking horses away, but um, because the start, it costs a lot of money. Um, but secondly, the idea is to try and work with people and say, You've got a horse, you've got a responsibility, you should be grazing it elsewhere. But horses have certainly been a major part of um, um, gypsy, and tra gypsy and traveler culture for, well, hundreds of years. And we obviously have a large gypsy and traveler community in Thamesmead and certainly around the area. Um, so there will always be horses. And the next slide shows how important the horses were to the local area. This is, you've obviously all seen this. Um, uh, sculpture, sculpture, which was commissioned in 2011 by a Scottish artist. I think he's done other stuff up in Scotland um, by the Scottish Parliament called Kelpies or something. Um, but this was to represent the, the horses in the local area and to celebrate the Gypsy Cob. Um, so there it sits on the on the on the middle of the roundabout in the Eastern Way. Next, please. 
I feel like Chris Whitty. Obviously, the other part of my role is to work with local gypsy and travellers. I try not to use the phrase gypsy and traveller community. There's no such thing as a gypsy and traveller community. Gypsies and travellers live as individuals within the, the, the community of Thamesmead. So I also work with um, a lot of national and London based agencies. And one of the things we did over 2019, and we actually managed to do it again uh, in July this year, we worked with an organisation called London Gypsies and Travellers and STAG, which are the Southwark Traveller and Gypsy Group. And we hosted an exhibition, uh, it was in the, in the hub. Um, very successful, lots of people came and looked at it, but this was around mapping um, gypsy and traveller caravan sites across London and how people have moved along um, major roads in the, in the past to, you'll, you'll often find gypsy and traveller caravan sites on local authorities are along major roads. It's just where people um, traveled for, for work and things. Now we've got records showing that the Belvedere Marshes um, were home to the largest gypsy camp in England in 1895. There are about 1,700 people living there. Um, and there are many Romani families across London can trace their histories to the Belvedere area. Um, and obviously Thamesmead's now home to this large Romani and Irish traveller community. And we've got Thistlebrook, um, the traveller site off the Harrow Manor Way, which is actually owned by Greenwich Council. That's the largest local authority traveller site in London. Um, so there's a lot of work that we do trying to celebrate the culture of uh, local Romanes and Gypsies. Um, our Thamesmead cultural programme has in fact also, we've commissioned two local artists who've been collecting stories from local Gypsies and travellers for the Thamesmead archive. And they've been working with a couple of um, local uh, travellers. One of them has been doing some sculptures and other bits of work, which was which was um, on show in the town centre. I don't know if anyone went to see, um, I think it was where the old bed shop was in the town centre, around the corner from Greeks. Um, and there was an exhibition on there, but they've also been working with a, a, a well-renowned artist from the traveller community, who's been um, making a film about the old Belvedere campsite, which, uh, was washed away when the, the Thames um, flooded in 1953. Some of the other work I've done over the last year, obviously Tom's talked about coronavirus, but we've been um, working with the uh, Greenwich and Bexley's Health Watch teams around getting advice to people living in caravans. Um, gypsies and travellers have got some of the, the, the poorest health problems amongst communities around the country. Um, so we've been working to talk about how to get inoculations and are you getting your vaccinations and what about children off school. The same as everyone else has got the same problems, but I've been concentrating on those communities. We've also had a question early on last year where people contacted us to say, can you get coronavirus from horses? And um, a quick check with the British Horse Society, we were able to reassure people and we put some notices up wash your hands properly, use gel if you can't, wash your hands and um, you won't get it, you can't get it from horses. Thank you then Sarah. The next one, I just wanted to show you, this is actually the, um, the Romany flag, this is the flag of the Roma people. Now obviously the, I could talk for hours about the Roma people but I won't hear. Um, this flag was, was created about 25 years ago and you'll, you might see an awful lot of the um, um, youngsters or, or people with caravans flying this flag. The idea is it, it's dark blue on the top, which represents the heavens, green below, which is the grass, and they have the wheel in the centre, which um, says we're moving on. And um, but this comes from a burst of fire from the creation of all time. It's uh, just a significant little flag. And my last slide, Sarah Jane. Obviously, I don't just work outside, I work within the, our um, own community of staff and try to spread the word to say, um, gypsies and travellers are um, an important group of people. 
who have probably suffered um, a lot of uh, discrimination over the years, I wrote up, wrote up these few little points to try and remind people, English gypsies and Irish travellers are actually recognised ethnic groups. So they always should be using capital G's and capital T's. I think Sarah Jane and a few of my other colleagues have been on the sharp end of the emails from me when they send me emails saying there's, a, there's some traveller issues and I send them back messages saying, <laughs> where's the capital letters? Um, I have obviously, while I've been talking, have referred to gypsies and travellers. Um, I won't call anyone a gypsy or traveller until I've actually talked to them and said, how would you want to be um, identified? Uh, and then we go from there. Challenging colleague colleagues or members of the public, there are a lot of offensive um, words used around gypsies and travellers. Um, you can this, report this as a hate crime if you hear it, and I try to say to people, report it to the police. The more that people report hate crime, um, the better everyone will get on well with each other. So that's my job. I'm uh, passing over now, thank you. Thanks very much, John. That was really interesting. I'm be so excited if there was ever a zebra in terms of me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. So um, up next we have Fiona. So Fiona, take it away. Thanks Sarah Jane. Um, so just as I mentioned earlier, my name is Fiona. I'm the Community Properties Manager for Peabody. Um, so my role is to oversee and manage all of our community spaces. Um, and my team um, is operational based. Um, so they are based within our community centres uh, or our community hubs that are staff led and that's across Thamesmead. And we kind of oversee all of the booking, um, all of the repairs, um, making sure that our community groups are safe and well supported um, and anything building related comes through to my team. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you a bit of an overview of what happens in our buildings and how many we've got um, and how you can kind of get access to them spaces. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we have 20 buildings across the portfolio in Thamesmead. Um, so uh, these are a mix of leasehold buildings and also staff led hubs. Um, so as well as the um, leasehold buildings, which we don't directly manage ourselves, um, they still have a range of services that run from them. Um, so an example of this would be at Thamesmead, uh, the link, we have a number of leased spaces in, within that building um, that people can still access. Uh, so for example, the gym at the link um, can still be accessed by the local community. Uh, we also have a number of buildings that are available to hire um, through community groups, residents and local businesses. Um, and these can be hired for lots of different events and sessions and um, can be hired through a long term basis if you wanted a regular community group session to happen there or even just as a one off booking. Um, we also have two new buildings that are coming on board, hopefully by spring 2022, uh, which we will talk a little bit more in the next couple of slides. Uh, Sarah, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just to just run through just what's already happening in our community centres, just to give you an idea of what our spaces can be used for um, and what groups are already running and there might be some services there that are already happening that you might be interested in. Um, so we've got a sports facility called Sporting Club Thamesmead um, and we have lots of different ranges of sports that happen there um, and these, these are for adults and young people um, and these include football, tennis, uh, netball, multi-sports and fitness classes um, and this space is um, can be hired by anyone that wants to kind of use that space for sports and other events. Um, we have a performing arts college uh, within Thamesmead which is a leasehold building um, but this kind of um, this is an education program that can also be access, accessed by loads of um, lots of different people, um, and it runs from the link at Thamesmead. Um, we have a construction college based at Titmus Avenue, um, and this is with our partner Youth Build, um, and they run some really amazing services for young people. Uh, we have loads of little community groups that run from our spaces like brownies and scouts. Um, we have many nurseries and childcare provision that run from our community spaces. Um, we have lots of charity organisations um, that deliver services across our portfolio, um, including mental health drop-in sessions, arts and crafts, cooking classes, um, holiday programmes that run throughout the whole year uh, for young people, um, including sports, arts and crafts and educational um, programmes. We have a number of community groups like faith groups and other therapies, uh, including like sports massage, pain therapies, um, 
like I mentioned before, mental health drop-in sessions, these also run from our community buildings. Um, as some of my other colleagues mentioned, uh, during the pandemic, uh, our services kind of changed and we used our building for different um, kind of uses throughout the pandemic and food hubs was a big thing that we did. Um, so some of our spaces turned quite quickly into essential food spaces where we run um, in partnership with um, organisations to deliver food to our local community and local residents. Um, some of these food hubs are still running in our community spaces um, and, and are turning into kind of like food pantries so local residents can access them for a small fee and um, can go and access food and get food on a regular basis, on a weekly basis. Um, we also hire our spaces for one-off um, social gatherings, so like children's birthday parties, or if someone had a special birthday coming up for the 30th, you can hire our spaces to do these kind of events as well. Um, so next slide, please, Sarah. So we have two new buildings that are coming on board that will be part of our portfolio. Um, so the Nest Community and Library building is already complete. Um, and this is located in South New Village. It's a new community and library building. Um, so on the ground floor will be the library, which will be run directly by London Borough of Bexley. Um, and then the next, next two floors are made up of the community spaces, um, which will be available to hire by all community groups, all um, residents, local people, and can be used for lots of different things, including events, enterprise space, uh, meetings, fitness classes, um, a range of different activities can be used um, within this building. Um, at the moment, the library works are being completed um, and they will be done hopefully by spring 2022. Uh, the community space is already complete and we're just kind of doing the final touches to that and we're hoping to launch that at the end of October. So please do look out for opening dates and tours of the building that will be coming up very shortly. Um, we have another new building that's currently being renovated at the moment, uh, which is the former Mooring Social Club. Uh, this is now named the Mooring Sociable Club um, and it's currently being renovated at the moment and, and will be with us hopefully within our portfolio by spring 2022. Um, this will host a, a range of different activities. It will have a cafe located on the first floor. Um, Peabody team uh, will be located there. So lots of different services will run from there, um, including including like employment and training, um, community services, um, and lots of different kind of working with different partners to bring services into that building. Um, there'll be lots of different spaces within this space also to hire. Um, so you can use that again for social gatherings. If you're starting up a community group, it might be an ideal space to come and have a look um, and see if it suits your needs. Um, so lots of different things will happen in these brand new spaces. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> uh, there should be one more slide, but I'll just talk through it. Oh, sorry, Fiona. Is that my fault? <laughs> I, I missed your last slide. I'm really sorry. That's okay. So it was just a quick overview on how to access these spaces. Um, so, like I said, my team managed directly all of the spaces we've been Thames made. Um, so if there is any further information that people want to get, um, you can go onto the Thames Mead Now website and it will give you an overview of what happens in our spaces and how to access them. Um, you can call us directly um, on a number and maybe I can put that in the chat so everyone's got access to that. Um, and then we've also got an Instagram page called community underscore hubs underscore TM, uh, where we upload all loads of pictures and lots of different events that are happening within our spaces um, and just give you an overview of community groups that are running from our buildings as well. Um, so please do get in touch um, and if there are any questions, obviously please put them in the chat, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, so just to say, um, what I can do, Fiona, if you send me those details, I will put them in the um, attendance email. So it will email everybody that's in the webinar today and it will have all those details. So we can sort that out. So they've got it. So, yeah, um, <laughs> massive apologies for you not having your last slide. <laughs> no problem. It's absolutely fine. I'll send that to <laughs> Never mind. OK. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our panellists. That was really, really interesting. I'm just going to um, stop sharing now. We have some questions. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to read out the questions and then ask our panel to answer them if they can. Um, 
So um, the first question um, is, um, why do the maintenance teams take so long to fix things like broken doors and gates? Um, I, don't, I assume that is around um, communal repairs rather than in homes. Can anybody answer that for me? Yeah, sure, SJ. Um, uh, we, we shouldn't. If, um, if anyone's got any specific examples, um, I mean, just drop, drop a line to SJ or you know, in the chat or wherever, wherever the appropriate way to do it, and I'd be happy to look at it. So we've got, we have got two multi-trades on the, within, within the public realms, and they look after all our public parks and open spaces. So if you're, if you're talking about sort of gates in housing areas or door entry systems or anything like that, we, we don't do those specialist work. So that would, be, that would be with a contractor. But if you've got any specific examples, Please do drop me, uh, drop us some detail, and I'll I'll check it for you, and then come back to you. Cheers. Um, so just to clarify, Tom. So um, the stuff that's to do with the buildings is with access. Is that right? And yeah. So we so we do more. so so we have got we we've got public realm. So we've got multi, four multi trades across the whole of the stock in Thamesmead. So they will do stuff like broken windows. Um, they'll do paint inside the blocks. Um, you know, if there's a door handle coming off, they'll do that. Um, they'll do glazing. Um, they'll do specialist glazing. We don't do fire glazing because it's it's very it's a specialist work that needs certification, etc. All the stuff that's gone on in the past with you know fire, etc. So, but there are but door entry electrical stuff. Um, we it's specialist work, so we 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 don't carry electricians. So yeah, of course that makes sense. Thank you, Tom. Um, so the next question is, um, will the local hub be reopening? Um, I'm going to guess um, that that is to do with the information hub, which is on Yard and Way. Um, so the answer, the, the short answer is that specific location isn't reopening. Um, I don't think we've actually said anything official yet, so I'm sorry if I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Um, but we will actually be, so the team that were originally based in that area will actually now be based in the Nest Library. Um, and we'll be hoping to move in the next couple of months. Well, I say move, we're all at home at the moment, but hoping to be in the Nest in the next couple of months. But um, just to say, we are looking at how we can still deliver that service. So before we were doing two days a week drop-in. Um, so we are still very committed to providing some service for people to be able to just come and ask us questions, whether that be face-to-face -face or through other channels like the, in, you know, um, online or in per on the phone, whatever. Um, but also I am always at the, generally at the marketing suite one day, which is a Monday, if anybody does want to come in and I will put my telephone number and all my contact details on the attendee email. So at any point you do want to contact me or speak to a person, because I know sometimes that can be a bit frustrating. If you do want to speak to a person, then please do, you'll be able to contact me. Um, so the next question um, is, um, who is responsible for the antisocial behaviour that is happening on the play area at Signet Square? Um, Only one for me. So presumably we're, we're, we're asking who is responsible for managing the antisocial behaviour rather than who is responsible for causing it. But um, uh, it really depends on, the, on what the reports are. So there's a, there's a few things that we've already been informed about, which we're dealing with. Um, and there is something that, because it's not directly linked to our residents, we're working with the police. So in the first instance, it's the police who would be dealing with any sort of criminal activity. Uh, but if it's uh, known residents who are causing issues, then uh, please let us know. So if you, if uh, residents can call uh, the customer hub on 0300 123 3456, give us some details of what it is that's happening, uh, we can investigate and, uh, and basically take proportionate action and if necessary, bring the police in. Uh, and we've got Craig who's around as well. And uh, one of the things that we can actually do to help manage the situation is we can also get the warden team to patrol, but we just need some more intelligence so that we know when to target those resources and and then uh, just trying to find out what, what the root problem is. Okay, thanks Pablo. So yeah, um... So who asked that question? If you want to contact me again, all my details will be, and then we can kind of, I can pass that over to neighbourhoods and they can look into it for you and then obviously give you some feedback on that issue. Um, so the next question is, how is your community engagement done? Um, so I guess that, I guess we all do community engagement, but I guess just from our team specifically, um, 
in as many possible ways as we can. So generally that will be things like using social media, doing things like this, um, also being available, for example, like I am in terms of just being a point of contact. Um, then also we have things like the Talk of Thamesmead quarterly newspaper, which goes out to everybody. Um, then obviously we have kind of more, um, what's the word, more targeted community engagement, which is around um, the projects. So that could be anything from events to um, project book clips to letters to more webinars like this um you know on-site meetings um yeah i just feel like the answer is in any possible way i guess that is one of our biggest challenges but also our biggest commitments is that we want to reach as many people in the community as possible um and so we try to cover you know every base we can um so, but I mean, you know, we are always interested if people have, you know, other suggestions as to ways to think that we could reach out that perhaps we're missing. So I, you know, I would love to, if anyone has got any suggestions, I would love to hear them. Um, so I'm just gonna, sorry, I can't multitask. Um, so next question is who deals with the fly tipping? Oh guys, I'll pick that one up. So we've, probably got two two streams and Craig just popped up there so I mean, Craig might want to add to my um, my words so our, our team uh, clear clear all of the fly fly tipping within Thamesmead but we, we need to be quite careful because we, we're not responsible for the whole of it so we've got lots and lots of adopted public highway nice examples Lensby Way you know constantly fly tip it's a responsibility of the London Borough of Bexley um, and then on the flip side of the coin, we've got the enforcement side of it, which is which is Craig. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Craig. Hello. Yes. Um, a lot of Tom said we do get a lot of fly tipping. A good case in point is Lensbury Way, uh, where it does happen a lot. Uh, unfortunately, on Bexley land, we can't do much. Um, we do go through rubbish. We send out warning letters and advise people how to dispose of their rubbish accordingly. Um, on the borough of Greenwich, we can take further action with the Greenwich Council refuse enforcement teams there and actually issue these permanent notices as well. Um, thanks, Craig. Um, thanks, Tom. Um, so the next question. Um, Oh, actually, I think the, the lights in Birchmere Park are not on when I cycled there last week at half seven, which it, when it was already dark. Not sure if they come on later, but it would help make the park still feel safer if the path which goes down the ramp past the Birchmere Hub, the cricket pitch down to Birchmere Lake was lit up. Oh, no problem at all. Um, now I'm aware of that. I'll raise that with our electrical team and get our contractor in this. Look at it. Thank you very much. I just say I got an email about that, so I will forward that. Yeah, on. forward it to me. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, great. Cheers. Thanks, Tom. Um, oh, <laughs> and another one, always ever popular. Can we have the sunflowers every year, please? Yes. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so we're, we, we, we've now run it two years, um, and we've we've added a lot more um, variety of flora into the sunflower scheme. There, we extended the schemes this year with the help of Phil Askew and the team. Um, into Abbey Way, and also you may have seen the B Road um, in the in the morning. So we're, we're currently talking. To, uh, so we're going to do all that again next year and more. Um, and we're currently talking to a, a Dutch bulb company. Um, so we're just about to place an order for uh, a, several thousand square meters of bulb planting for the spring. So we'll have spring flower and also be doing stuff in the summer again. And it's been a great success. And yes, I love it as much as you, because I'm just standing there looking at it when it comes into flower. So yeah, we will. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think everyone agrees. It, they look amazing. Absolutely yeah, they do. Amazing. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. We're doing, I think we're going to do a maze next year. So it, rather than just ooh, a soft crop field. So yeah, we'll be, and we might be able to build a structure um, in the middle of it that you can stand on and look at the maze and stuff at worst. So. That yeah. sounds exciting, cool. Tom. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> um, uh, next question is, how do you feed people find out about hiring the community centres? 
Um, so we, I will share that information with you, Sarah, so everyone can have that. Yeah. Um, so the best way to do it, to get in touch really, is, is via our telephone number. It goes through to our main reception at 14 Pub Thamesmead, um, and we're open seven days a week. So, um, and there's an opportunity to leave a message there and we'll always get back to you. Um, as mentioned, follow us on Instagram. There's always updates on there on how to book spaces. Uh, we are working on a bit of a comms plan on, on getting is kind of out in the community what spaces are available and kind of um, how you book them. Um, so that's not available at the moment, but we are working on that. So hopefully we'll be able to do some, um, have some leaflets and literature that we can share with local community, but definitely get in touch with the team via the telephone number and Instagram page. Thanks, Joni. Yeah, we'll put that on the email. Um, so, um, so that again, it's sort of the next question is sort of, identical to that really is where are the community centres advertised so I think you just pretty much answered that one there Fiona unless you've got anything else to add yeah no we are aware that it's, it's sometimes some of our spaces are quite hard to find um, and that is something that we're working across Peabody to kind of solve um, so you know signage and obviously advertising them um, so yeah definitely look out for what's coming because hopefully we'll have some more information out there for people to be able to book and find out what spaces are available. Um, but do check our website as well, Thamesmead now, because there's lots of information on there about spaces as well. Yeah, so the, again, another question, <laughs> very similar, Fiona, I'm just saying, where are the details of all the events that you've mentioned? Again. Um, there isn't a specific place where they are. Instagram's probably a good page to kind of follow um, and find out what's happening in each individual space. Uh, we do try and focus on a, um, a particular community group each month um, and either via the newsletter or the website or um, Instagram just so that it can so people can find out what's going on particularly with that group I think the last one we did was around brownies uh, because they've been off throughout Covid um, so we wanted to give them a bit of a focus about what they do and what services they bring to Jubilee Hall um, so we do try and do that on a regular basis um, but yeah, there isn't a, a, a specific place where that information is yet, but we, we are working on that. So hopefully there will be a place where you can go and find out all of that information. Thank you, Fiona. Yeah, I think that obviously as well, the um, Terms Week Now website is a good place to start in terms of certain events that are put on, but I understand that that doesn't cover everything, especially with the, the non-affiliated groups from Peabody. Um, so next question, are there any photos or drawings of the Mooring Social Club available to see what the space is like? Oh, that's a good question. Um, do you know, Fiona? I think I, I think we do have some somewhere. <laughs> we definitely do have some. Um, and yeah, I'm sure that we will be, will be able to share. Maybe that's a question that I can pick up with Kate uh, and the team. Um, because they're definitely out there. I just don't know where they're located. So I'll take that question away and, and find that out. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. And I think actually we'll, we'll follow on from that and we'll try and maybe get some up on the website. I know that there is a whole moorings page, so let I will touch base with you and let's get some, if we can get some photos on the website and then if we direct people to the website, I think that's great. Thank you. Um, so next question. Um, some local residents complain about antisocial behaviour. Complaints? the complaint is that there's no one to report it to um you rarely see police around um as it's private as some is private land and you never see a warden how do we get in contact with these with them uh, i'd like to jump in there um when you say it's private land um whatever about I don't this, know. this happening <laughs> um it, it would be yeah anything with antisocial behavior um, contact the neighbourhood managers or Sarah Jane and it will be passed over to the warden team. We work very closely with the local policing team. Uh, I do understand they've been a bit busy at the moment with aid as well as the local stuff going on, um, but we will endeavour to try and help you out. I mean, we can come talk to you, find out day dates, times, places, and we can get on with it. And then go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'll just echo that. Yeah, if you if um, you want to send me an email with more detail, and then we can look at definitely can look, look into that. And Craig will then confirm. God, I can't speak. Craig will then feed back to you. Um, so next question. Um, well, this is about horses, John. So it's definitely for you. Is the is there any land for reserved for horses to graze? Well, we've got um, four paddocks in Southmere Park. 
which at the moment there isn't any more space there. But um, obviously, if someone wants to approach me and let me know if there's a, I can keep a little waiting list and see if anyone. Depends how many horses people have got, <laughs> but I can always talk to other local landowners like Thames Water and, and people like that. They may have some paddock space or, or fields available. Um, yeah, so pass on some, get me some details, Sarah Jane, and I'll uh, I'll investigate. But at the moment, we haven't got any in uh, in our own land. Okay, thanks, John. Um, yeah, so again, I will echo if you want to give me more detail, if you're looking for some space for a horse, I don't know. Um, okay, so and then just a comment um, that, uh, Tom, you've got people excited about the sunflower maze idea. Um, people love that. Um, and um, are the contact details of the community centres in any notice boards? Um, as I said, we will forward those details on. But do you know, Fiona, if they are in any notice boards? Do we have any notice boards at the community centres? Uh, we do. We do have um, noticeables inside the, the centres that we manage directly. Um, so people that are accessing the community centres um, will be able to see what's what's going on and what's available and stuff. But the ones outside, um, we don't directly manage. Um, so I think that's kind of an internal conversation we need to have about how we kind of get these back up um, being used um, and how other teams can access them to kind of advertise what's going on in spaces. Um, so yeah, I think that's one that we need to take away and really kind of work out a plan of action. We could um, notice boards. Um, it does come up quite a bit, so it is on our radar about notice boards and what we're doing with them. Um, so yeah, definitely one for us to take away. Thanks, Fiona. And then another one around: um, Are there any events for retired people? Um, so we have a number of community groups that run from our spaces that run um, over 50s kind of um, sessions. Um, We've got um, groups that run, um, I don't want to give examples because it might be kind of like I'm being a bit stereotypical, um, but we've, we've got lots of spaces that kind of have um, sessions for people that are older um, and at retirement age. So examples of that would be we've got Tai Chi that runs from one of our spaces. Um, we have bingo classes, we have um, just kind of like knit and natter and sewing classes and stuff like that. So there's lots of things that um, that can be accessed um, and obviously from lots of different spaces, not just one space. So, um, yeah, be happy to if there's some direct direct information that someone wants, um, if they can email yourself, Sarah, you can always direct that to me and I can give them some information. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Fiona. And then final question. Um, why is there no security on the square? Um, I, I assume that means Signet Square. I don't know um, if, I don't know, Pablo, do you want to pick that one up? I'm not sure. Uh, sure, I mean, it really depends on what kind of security. So we've got uh, CCTV equipment that's uh, that's always running 24 hours a day. And uh, we've got, the, uh, we've got the, um, the wardens who... Uh, again, they do patrols at on an ad hoc basis, and uh, as I mentioned early on during the presentation, we're going to have the concierge who will be doing uh, uh, who will be doing their security patrols as well. So it really depends on uh, what it is that the question is asking in terms of security. But there is security. Just um, it, it might be a case that we just need to communicate a little bit better and and differently. So uh, we, we can always take that back if there's any additional information. Okay, thanks very much, Pablo. Um, and then, um, and then, so just there was also just to, to say, um, Fiona, just following on that, it would be really great if we could have all the events in one place. But as I said, we I think we've already touched on that. So yes, absolutely. Um, okay, I, we have literally run out of time. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the panel. Um, it was really, really interesting. Well, I thought it was interesting, so brilliant. And um, thank you, everybody who came along and watched and asked really, really good questions. Um, just to say that this um will be put up on youtube so you can watch whenever you want um if you feel like watching again or you want to get your neighbors to watch it um and you will all get an email probably tomorrow and i will get all of those details that we discussed and that will be on that email <clears throat> so um you can have all of that information and know who to contact and then i said all my details will also be on there so any other questions or any queries please do let me know um, also, just to say, we have another one of these. So we're trialing these once a month. We have another one of these um, next month. So they're the first Tuesday of the month. So the next one will be 
oh, now I've put myself under pressure. I don't know the what date the next one is on the, uh, oh, the second, there we go, 2nd of November. Um, but again, we'll put some more details up on social media and on our website. Um, so please do keep an eye out for that. Um, so yeah, so thank you everybody. Thank you for your time. Um, and we hope to see you all next month. So thanks everybody for taking part. Cheers guys. Thanks everyone. See you later. Bye. Bye.